Uh, so this morning is um, approaching difficult questions, painful situations and awkward silence. And you all came. Well done. Well done. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, which might have been an app error, um, don't worry. Uh, I'm hoping that you've picked up one of these on the way in. Um, a bookmark that's just covering the points that we went through yesterday. So yesterday was this side, everyday good conversations. Um, and today is the the other side uh, when it's tough. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, there will be all of the seminar talks available on the Keswick website after week three. Um, or if you like to have a physical thing that you can put in your laptop, um, you can buy an MP3. Is that right? Is that the right word? I don't know what I'm talking about. A thing that you put on your laptop, you can play them. Okay, and you can buy one of those. And I don't even know how much it is, but I'm sure it's a bargain. Okay. Um, yesterday, the big take-home point of yesterday um, was that as parents, uh, I want us to remember, even when we perhaps doubt it and don't feel like it, that we are God's gift to our children, just as they are God's gift to us. You don't need to know all the answers, um, but you can, you can start to point to Jesus in everyday conversations. That was the big take-home message of yesterday. Um, you are God's gift to your children, just as they are to you. Um, you don't need me, because they've got you. You've got... Does that make sense? Maybe. Okay, uh, today, a couple of things. Uh, questions on Slido again. Um, if, if that terrifies you, uh, Jodie has got the code and a phone down here. We'll have a couple of moments to chat. So if you wanted to trot over to Jodie and ask her to put the question in for you, you can. It just means that we can prioritise questions that are sort of within the scope of this seminar today. Um, let me tell you a tiny bit about me. Uh, I'm Amy. Uh, I am a mum, a mum of four adopted children. I work for Faith in Kids. Uh, I uh, present the podcast series and write resources um, for helping parents and churches teach the Bible well, hopefully. Um, and somebody did ask me yesterday, uh, I think there's a paediatric physio in the room who spotted me and outed me and said, what did you do before that? Uh, so I worked for many years uh, as a children's occupational therapist, uh, working uh, in the community with children with additional needs and physical disabilities. Um, so I guess there's a mashup of lots of things that have been learned over life and ministry um, and parenting. Um, and I want to say with all of those hats on, kids worker in church, mom, uh, OT, Faith in Kids team member, uh, parents really are at the key to sort of conversations and caring for their children. So championing parents is a really wonderful thing for us to all be doing. Okay, let's go. As parents we can often find ourselves longing for a moment's peace. Here is a photo that I posted um, on Instagram. It was during the joys of lockdown. It was a fraught day. Uh, we were homeschooling four children whilst trying to hold down a part-time and my husband's full-time job. Um, we were trying to hold together for children that love routine and children that found security in routine, the anxiety of everything that felt familiar being gone. We went out for a walk, one of those nature walks, remember them. And this is what I posted because this is what was very real in that moment. For eight seconds today, it was literally only eight, I, I gave them the challenge. We're going to stand still and we're going to listen to the wind in the reeds for eight seconds we listened to the wind rustle the reeds. No one said anything, and it was beautiful. It was literally the highlight of my day on that particular day. We can all relate to that moment when the chatter, the constant requests for snacks, the arguments, the sniping at one another ceases for a moment, and there's a little bit of peace. We take a breath, we put the kettle on, and then we realise... Oh goodness, it's been five minutes. 
probably means that somebody is somewhere doing something they shouldn't, and it's probably with a Sharpie marker, I better go and find out what's going on. There is, however, a bigger problem than too much talking. It's not enough talking. For our children and young people, the inability to find the words to talk about what is going on, the struggle to handle big feelings and to know what to do with them can come out in all kinds of unhelpful ways. Let me give you a few examples that you can probably understand and relate to. There's the toddler who wants you to buy them a toy in the middle of the supermarket shop. There's some bright plastic on the shelf and I want it. And you say, it's not what we've come for today, darling. And it ends with a full-blown screaming fit of them on the floor. And you trying to decide, carry on with the shopping, or do I just leave? Or how about the anxious child who feels like they don't fit in at school? They're constantly checking. Do they have everything they need? They're struggling to sleep. They're awake really early. They're having meltdowns over seemingly insignificant things like lunchboxes or shoes. And there's a hyper awareness. What are other people wearing? What are other people doing? And their head is always on a spin. Or perhaps there's the more extreme moment when you discover that your child has written swear words on the wall, cut up clothing, or even hurt themselves. In that moment, as a parent, our emotions are big, they're real, they're valid, and of course, we want to do things that might make it worse. We might want to yell at the toddler on the floor of the supermarket, stop being such a brat, you're so embarrassing right now. The temptation to tell the eight-year-old worrying about the next day at school. Oh, for goodness sake, stop worrying about what everyone else thinks of you. To yell at my son, how dare you write such horrible things. To tell my daughter, why would you do that to yourself? These are the moments in parenting when we are reminded that this is exactly why our children have parents. This is the evidence in case you needed it, that they can't handle it all on their own and they actually need people with them in their corner, fighting for them, loving them and helping them. All behaviour is communication. The thing that all of those moments, the tantruming toddler, the stressed out eight-year-old, the destructive 11-year-old, the teenager experimenting with hurting themselves. The thing that they all have in common is your child is telling you, I am not okay. It's as complicated as that. I am not okay. And I need you to know that I'm not okay. And this is my way of showing you. It's up to us as parents to work out how, do we, how can we respond in a way that is helpful? And as Christian parents, how can we respond in a way that is hope-filled? Not crushing, you've failed, you shouldn't be doing this, but a way that is hope-filled. This is a verse that we as a family have clung very tightly to. Um, and that I personally have clung very tightly to through a difficult time uh, with one of our kids in particular. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9 tells us, But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Your family, your life, will have a different this. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. The Apostle Paul is talking about an extreme time in his life when he was under great pressure. He says, far beyond his ability to endure, so that, I quote, we despaired of life itself. 
Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. I think parenting in our culture, and I know it's definitely true for me, is often the thing that most regularly brings us to the end of ourselves, that most regularly brings us to the end of our store of resources of wisdom. I know for me, when our son was creating chaos at home and really, really struggling, I go to my mum's shelves. I go to my imaginary pantry of all the things that I have to help. And I stand there and I think, wow, well, here are my shelves of fun days out, packing hacks, family-friendly meals, fun activities for us all to try together, winning outfits for a day out, things that I have learnt about what I should pack in my changing bag. But now I'm facing, he's cutting stuff up. He's cutting up clothing. There's nothing on my shelf for that. I don't know what to do. I've come to the end of my ability to know what to do. It can feel like a sentence that feels a bit like death. This isn't going away. And I don't know what to do. Nothing seems to be working. The ordinary things that we've tried, that everybody else seems to be doing, it seems to be going okay for them, um, doesn't seem to be working here. We must have done everything wrong to end it up here. We're clearly terrible parents. As Christians, there's hope for days like that. And there's hope for feelings like that. The Bible is clear. Our children face struggles. Our children face brokenness. And so do we. Because we are broken people living in a broken world. We can expect suffering and struggle. And that means good parents have kids who struggle. Failing parents have kids who are smashing it. Most importantly... We're all in both of those categories, probably, if we're honest, most days of our lives. Failing, imperfect, struggling people, as Christians, have a perfect saviour who raises the dead. Parenting might be the thing that pulls this out of you for the first time. It might be the thing that makes you say, this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now, you'll probably still think, I'd rather, I'd rather have learnt it in a book. I'd rather have read it somewhere. I'd rather not have lived it. But we can trust God with that. And that's the way he normally works in our lives to help us learn things. For me... My son's repeated cycle of destructive behaviour and his brokenness. Once his mess was discovered, his desire to be in the moment, to get it right, to, to, to want to be the person who wasn't doing this, to want to make better choices next time, but then his complicated belief system that he'd put together, that what he was doing was helping him feel powerful, and his tendency to end up right back in the cycle again. Anxiety, destruction. 18 months in to having these conversations, to consistently caring, um, there was a day that we were sitting on the bedroom floor. He'd messed up again. He was feeling incredibly broken, and he thought, there's no way I can change. And if I'm really honest, I was starting to think the same. It felt like a hopeless situation. But then I remember... Jesus rose from the dead. There's no more hopeless a situation than the sealed tomb of a dead Jesus. Hope is gone, life has ended. If Jesus can walk out of a tomb and bring new life, Jesus can walk us out of this room here today. He can walk us out. He can bring hope where there is none because he can bring life where there is death. I need to believe that. I need to tell my son that, 
so that when I say it out loud, he starts to know that's what it means to be a Christian in this moment. To say we have help when there's none, we have hope when there's none, because we has a, have a saviour who brings life where there is death. Telling my son, God can bring life here. God can bring help here. His spirit can be with you to help you do what you can't. Even when I can't, we can expect to see change. We can expect to see life. It's going to look small and it's going to be slow and steady, but it will happen. I'm going to believe it. Will you believe it with me? We had a prayer in that moment. Thank you, Jesus, that when we feel like we can't do it, we know we've got you. Amen. That was it. That was it. And it was the start of a slow walkout of a tough situation. If it's just up to your ability to change, if it's just up to your ability to say the right thing as a parent, if it's just up to your kids' ability to listen and do what you've told them, it's going to be hard. But if we've got God who can bring life and can bring hope, maybe, just maybe, we're going to be okay. I'd love you to spend a couple, we're going to have two times to talk to one another this morning. Um, I'd love you to just turn to your neighbour. From what I've just said, what has resonated with you? Doesn't have to be big and dramatic. When does parenting bring you to the end of yourself? Perhaps it's the time that you put the dinner, ta dinner on the table. We talked about this earlier. And your kids go, oh, that's disgusting. And you think, the hours that I've put into preparation for that, you're so ungrateful. Perhaps it's something else. When does parenting bring you to the end of yourself? And how does the resurrection offer hope? Okay, you can do it. Get past the British upper lip, whatever thing, the embarrassment. Have a chat with the person next to you. You've got... Four minutes. Well done. Look how easy that was. Right, now you've all made friends and you've all broken the barrier of being able to talk to one another. Uh, a little later on, you'll have a chance to talk to one another again and you could jump straight back into those conversations. That's brilliant. Um, I just wanted to go through a couple... <laughs> uh, sorry. My daughter would like to know what to wear today. <laughs> Clothes. Okay. Uh, she's, she's 12. It's possibly the most important decision of her day. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? Oh, <laughs> questions. Just a couple of questions uh, that have come in that I wanted to just mention. Um, I think... I do want to just say there is a big thing about role that I wanted to mention. So these seminars are particularly uh, aimed at parents um, and I am unapologetically championing the role of parents in the lives of their children. Um, you are, you are as parents, the biggest influences for faith in the life of your children. You literally are the best person to have these conversations. So I am absolutely delighted that there are grannies and aunties and kids workers and youth workers here this morning um, and pick stuff up. And what I would say is pick stuff up so that you can support parents, so that you can support parents in doing these things, so that you can support parents in having these conversations. Just slightly remember the role that you play. Um, so I would say uh, my mum, um, she is still a parent, uh, so she gets to parent me. Uh, she gets to have tough conversations with me. She gets to explore stuff with me. She gets to explore my thinking, um, but she doesn't do that with my children. She knows that her role is to support me um, and to care for my children. So Granny has been absolutely amazing in our family life, primarily in her support of me. And her role with grandchildren has been to love them, to show consistently, consistent care and to be the predictably wonderful Granny that they know that she will be. Um, grandparents, you don't have to be exciting. 
You don't have to try and be somebody that you're not. Just please keep being the person that you are. So for my son, when we go to Granny's house, and Granny will take you for a walk, she'll make you appreciate nature, you'll probably watch a documentary on television, and there will be a cheese sandwich. <laughs> there is amazing security in predictable Granny being the anchor that holds family life. So I'm having difficult conversations, we're exploring lots of things, and then we arrive at Granny's, and she makes us all a cheese sandwich. And let me tell you, if that's all you're doing, just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Okay. Um, we're going to move on. Well, one other question I wanted to mention that came through. Uh, parents, how... Can you give me advice oh, about parenting adult children? Uh, so, parenting doesn't stop. Uh, I'm coming to realise that. I still need a parent. Um... And I think there is a bit of a difference. There is, there is positivity that you can offer. There are things that I'd love uh, grandparents to be able to say to their children who are parents. And I think there's just a little, a little alarm bell that I want to ring to say, just make sure that the thing that you are worried about is not your personal preference. So there's, there's gospel issues and there's preference issues. So um, if, your, uh, if your grandson wants to have a nose ring, uh, you might prefer that he didn't, uh, but don't interfere. Let the parent make the choice and be supportive. There you go. You could come back at the, me on Slido on that if you want. Jodie's got the number, so if you can't do the technology, talk to Jodie in the next slot. Okay, um, we're starting on the top. This is your handout. Uh, we're starting on the top of our bullet points for today. Uh, of steps to take when it's tough. Uh, and I've deliberately put those top two together, which sound a little bit like they contradict one another. Consistently care and be willing to make changes. Let me explain. The care that we show our children and the values we hold as Christians are the immovable anchor. We love you. Forgiveness is on offer. God's word is our guide. Church community matters, and you as a family get to add your own unique flavour to that, and perhaps what other things that you are going to value as a family. Uh, you could be exciting, we did this once, and write a family value statement. You might not be that kind of family, but maybe you are. But let me tell you, whether you write your value statement down on a piece of paper or not, your kids know what your value statement is. I asked our children when they were little, what do you think our value statement is? What do you think matters to us as a family? Loving Jesus, don't play with doors, <laughs> sit down when you're eating. That's okay. As they've got older, our values have apparently changed. Loving Jesus, being active, being kind. That's what they've told me they think. Our matters in our family. It might be an interesting exercise because if academic results really matter in your family, your kids will know. If sporting achievement really matters in your family, your kids will know. It would be great if we had loving Jesus, knowing him, forgiving one another in our family values. We're going to hold on to those things that direct us and keep us consistently care, caring, but we're going to be willing to be flexible. We're going to be willing to change the way we live, to change the things that we do, to accommodate our kids' needs. An example from our family life, we really value the gospel. We know that being in church community and being with God's people really matters. We're one of the involved families at church. I'm on the Sunday school rota, you may not be surprised to know. But on the morning that we're getting ready to get out of the door to go to church, and we discover that my son is in crisis, and he's cut something up, and he's in a mess, my husband and I, we look at one another, and we go, we know that being at church matters. We know that being with the people of God matter. We also know that Talking to our son in this moment matters too. So we're going to do the, what we're going to do here thing. 
So I'm going to go, you're going to stay, you're going to talk with him. Yeah, we're going to take the other kids because we want them to be part of the community. Okay, we've got this. This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to handle it today. Another week, I go, he stays. And then as this becomes a repeated pattern, we speak to our church family about it and say, listen, guys, consistently turning up on a Sunday morning is putting a pressure on a situation that's got enough pressure on it. Uh, for this term, I need to step back from the rotor just so that if stuff kicks off, I'm ready to care for my son. Amazing. Great. How can we help you with that? How can we pray for you in that? So you see, we're still holding that value of being with God's people and being in church community, but we're still willing to be flexible about what that looks like in the moment of crisis. You can work that out for your family too. It might not look as dramatic as that, but you can work out how do we show consistent care, hold to the values that we hold to whilst being willing to make changes to meet the needs of our kids. Don't leave the chat. Now, I don't know about you, but being a Christian seems to involve being on a lot of WhatsApp groups. Um, and being a parent seems to involve being on even more WhatsApp chat groups. And uh, the WhatsApp chat groups can be overwhelming. And we would all secretly love to leave some of them, wouldn't we? However, we're not brave enough to. So we mute them and we stay in them and they probably drive us crazy. What I would say is be, you should probably be more brave to leave those chats, but don't leave the chat with your children. That means we're in the conversation for the long haul. That means that this isn't the only time we're going to talk about this. That means that we're going to keep coming back. That means that when you're furious with me, I mean, I might have to leave the room for a moment to calm down, but I'm going to come back in. I can see that you're not okay. I want to understand. I'd love you to help me understand what's going on in your life. I just don't want to tell you, you'll never get it. Okay, but just so you know, I'm going to keep on asking. And I'm going to try and keep working it out. And I'm going to carry on being here for you. I'm going to keep on turning up and I am not going to leave this chat. For me, not leaving the chat has looked like a lot more silence, a lot more sitting together, trying to work out the words that we need to get feelings out. A lot more of me guessing, is it this? Is it this? Do you feel this way? Tell me if I'm wrong, I'm gonna make five guesses. If I'm absolutely off on all of them, that's okay but we need to try and understand what's happening. For my friend Ed and his daughter, it's looked very different. It's looked like a lot more yelling and a lot more slammed doors. The temptation for both of us, for either facing silence or facing yelling, is to want to leave the chat. For him, he wants to argue back with his daughter. Being ridiculous, you don't know you're born. I don't care what everyone else is doing. This is what we do in our house. I know it's annoying, but we can talk about stuff in a calmer, better way than that. We can apologise to our children when we've lost it. We can come back to them later and say, listen, I know that all you got back from me there was stress, but that's actually because I really, really love you. And when I try and explain stuff to you, it feels like a big pressure. I want you to get it. So it can sometimes come out wrong. I've thought about it. I've calmed down. This is what I was trying to say to you in that moment. And please tell me if I'm wrong. Because I am not you. And I want to understand. I know it's annoying. It's also true. When your child yells at you. Or writes swear words on your wall. Or cuts up stuff in your house. It's actually a compliment. You are their safe space. You are where they are coming with all of their emotion. You are the parent that they are splurging it all on. Being in the chat might not feel like it, but it is a privilege. And the person saying that to you has had nail varnish thrown all over a sofa. 
we can stay in the chat. Yes, whilst getting it wrong. Yes, whilst saying things that we might regret and needing to apologise. That is what being in the chat looks like. Ask good questions. This might seem really obvious, but I think it's worth saying. Your child is different from you. Their brain is different from you developmentally. They haven't developed all the reasoning and all the skills and had all the experiences that you have. They live in the moment. They're concrete thinkers. They are risk takers. And God has developed the developing child to teenage brain and puberty. And it is his good plan. Now, I have often felt like I would like a word on this design. Could we bring some of these hormones in later? Could we dial them down a bit? Could we, could we, could we speed up the whole frontal lobe risk taking? Could we speed that up? The sort of awareness of consequences and emotional care of one another's. Like, could we, could we get to that bit quicker and avoid a lot of the stress? Um, a Christian psychologist that I um, shared a lot of my concerns about perhaps <laughs> the shortcomings of God's design uh, was able to stay, say to me, listen, young people have to be brave. So much of their life is facing big changes and stepping out, going up to high school. You step up from primary to secondary, it's massive. You have to decide what you're going to do with the rest of your life. You make relationships that will be really significant. Some of them head off to uni or start their careers. They have to be really, really brave. There's a reason why all that risk-taking testosterone and all those other powerful feelings and emotions are there because we need them. We need them to help us. God has made that beautiful design for growing up in the context of families. One with the other together. We are supposed to be the safeguard rails. We're supposed to be the loving support while all of this happens. So if you can remember that your child is different from you, it means you can ask them really good questions. Don't assume that you know what is going on in their head. Uh, my son and I were standing uh, on a beach in our wetsuits on our exotic summer holiday in Scotland. And uh, he looked at me and said the following words, Mom, I wish I looked like you in a wetsuit. I thought, you cheeky rat. My son with his athletic, slim, springy body and me, when God made me, he chose pieces from the drawer that said, robust. I'm okay with that, but when my son says to me, Mum, I wish I looked like you in a wetsuit, my immediate thought was, cheeky little thing. But because I know his brain is different from mine, I said, what do you mean by that? Mum, you're so strong. You're so strong, nobody can push you over. And I am skinny and weak. And I feel frightened around lots of boys my age because they're so much bigger and stronger than me. What? I didn't even know you thought that. I think you've got an amazing body. God has given you the perfect body for the personality you have. You're like a wired spring. You're like a squirrel, like the, the one off Ice Age. If you had the robust body like mine, you wouldn't be able to cycle to school, come home, then go windsurfing, then do this, then run, then do... You've got just the right body. And you know what? God's given me just the right body too. Asking good questions. Tell me why you think that. Tell me what you mean by that. Don't jump to conclusions. Your children have a different brain from you. Pray and get others praying. Praying for your children can sometimes feel like a very one-dimensional thing to do. We pray that they'll come to faith early in life and we're done. Imagine if we had a bigger vision of what God wants for our children. Imagine if we could pray for aspects of their character. 
Imagine if we could pray about the things that they're struggling with. Imagine if we could pray about their friendship group. Imagine if we could pray about how much they hate reading with them. Imagine if we could pray about how much they love rugby and how this can give them a taste of how good God is. And then there are the moments of crisis that all we can do is pray because there seems to be nothing left. That's when you call in the cavalry. That's when you set up the emergency WhatsApp group for all your favourite saints and you put them on it and you say, guys, help. That's when you get your sister, because you can't do it because you're too exhausted, to fast and pray for that appointment, for that conversation, for that hard thing that's coming up. That's when you ask your friends to pray, pray for strength and for patience beyond human understanding. That's when you plead with God to help. Some of the heroes of our family's WhatsApp prayer group are, are actually in the room here today, but are certainly here this week. I will never, ever forget the support that they offered our family. There's a challenge to sharing what's tough. Being vulnerable with the embarrassment that can feel like your life. Sharing the lows, sharing the struggles can feel really, really hard. Okay, be wise who you share it with. But the minute you get to share your burden with those who love you and love the Lord, they actually tell me it's a privilege. And I know it is because it's a privilege for me to do that for others. We get to share the burden, we get to share the struggle, and we get to share the answers too. They've been on that journey with us. They've seen God answer prayer. They've had just as much of a blessing as they have shared a burden. We really should pray for one another in our parenting some more. Okay, this is your final time. I'm sorry, James. Uh, you've still got two to choose from. Uh, I made you do this yesterday. I gave you two case studies. Choice is apparently complex, but you can pick one. Uh, talk to your neighbour or talk about whatever you want to in your family life. But just in case that's too far, talk about one of these. Um, Sam is 11. He's been much quieter at home recently. He's been biting his nails, picking his fingers a lot, and he seems really, really low. What could you do? What good questions could you ask? And what could you pray don't get pulled in too wide. I just want you to think about those couple of practical steps that we've talked about this morning. What could you pray and what good question could you ask? Or Hannah. Hannah is seven. She's been really pushing everyone's buttons at home. She's annoying her sister. She's refusing to do what she's been asked. And she's cross and angry about everything. What good question what could you ask? What prayer could you pray? You've got four minutes. Go. Okay, guys, look how easy it was when you had permission. Look how easy it was for you to start conversations about difficult things in our kids' lives. Um, you could have talked for much longer, and guess what? You can. You can. The conversations that you've maybe started with the person who's sitting next to you, with the person that you came with, um, you could carry on having them. God has literally given us one another within the family of God to support and help one another. If you're struggling with something, look around you in your church. God has given you, literally given you people that can help you navigate this stuff. Even if all they can offer is praying with you, that's amazing. Okay, I just want to show you a little video. Dave, we're going to be, this is all good. It worked beautifully yesterday. It's going to be the same today. Here we go. Growing up is the great adventure God designed. From their first toddling steps to their shiny school shoes to the day they're nearly as tall as you. How did you get so big? Our children are growing up. As our children get bigger, so do the challenges they face. They're soaking up information from all around them, working out who to listen to and figuring out who they think they are. 
they're surrounded by opinions, friends and so many screens. The world around them seems really loud. All this happens as they're navigating their own thoughts and feelings with puberty on the horizon. How will they work it all out? As those who love them, we don't need to worry. We can trust the one who has never worried and holds the answers. Our Heavenly Father loves our children even more than we do. He will help them and guide us. He chose their brilliant bodies, he made them male or female, he designed good relationships and invented big feelings. Together, in our churches, we can live and enjoy what we believe. Our children can grow up hearing God's good story. His word helps us make sense of the voices around us. We can choose to hold on to what he says is true and ignore the rest. Our brand new Growing Up resources help explore the Bible, support churches and encourage families to start good conversations about bodies, gender and marriage. They're growing up, so come on, let's share God's good story. I wanted to show uh, you that little clip, um, partly to pinpoint you and signpost you to some of the other resources that we as Faith in Kids have on offer, particularly on some of the wider things within this space. Um, and partly the reason we've put these resources together is because we really do want parents to be having great conversations with their children. And uh, we believe that that will happen best within the context and with the support of our church communities. Uh, we really do need to be brave as we talk about some of the bigger issues that our kids are facing in their everyday world. Um, a question came in on Slido, and I've also had a couple of parents mention to me. Um, the challenges of our kids uh, moving up to secondary school and uh, the things that are talked about, about relationships, about sex, about gender, um, and how can we help our children be ready for those conversations, particularly for our children who are perhaps neurodiverse or struggle, um, how can we help them be ready? Um, I would say uh, there's, there's an even more of a reason why we as parents need the support of churches within this space. Um, historically, we used to be able to rely perhaps on education, um, things in school, to be saying similar-ish things to we would be saying at church. That's no longer the case. Um, so we really need to step up as parents to start these conversations well, and we really want churches to be able to do that too. That's why those Growing Up resources exist. Um, there's also a, a set of um, parent podcast series that talk through a lot of those big issues too that you might find really helpful. Um, but the reason I particularly wanted to show that video clip as well, and the lovely Alex, who is our creative lead and visuals guy, is here today, um, is that that force field picture that he brought to life for us um, is, is what we want to ground our children in. We want to repeat the truth to our children, and we need to repeat it to ourselves so that we know we have a rock to stand on and we have good news to share. That whole idea of your child being overwhelmed by the messages coming at them from the world, from culture, from friends, from screens, it's confusing, it's hard to navigate. As Christians, we can be confident that we have a good story to share. That foundation of God's word is what we stand on. And when we believe it, it is like living within that force field. So when I hear people saying things about me, you're ugly, you're fat, you're stupid, you're this, you're that, you're the other. I've got a way to navigate. Am I going to listen to that or not? Is this saying the same things about me as God would? Is this saying that to live the same way as God would? That's how I'm going to navigate whether this gets to stay or whether this can bounce off, whether this can go in the bin. Is this going to stick or is this going to go? Is this saying the same things to me as God would? Repeat the truth to yourself and your child. Live in the present. Past mistakes can crush. Future fears can overwhelm. Anxiety is a really big thing for our kids and young people. And even being worried about being worried can be a thing. 
we can help to ground them in the present. A lot of those self-calming exercises that you'll find lots of advice on on uh, NHS websites about deep breathing, about noticing sounds, about feeling things, they're all about trying to keep present in the moment, not letting what could happen, not letting catastrophizing about the future overwhelm you in the moment, not letting the mistakes that you've made in the past influence what you do now. As Christians, we are all over this. We've got forgiveness, we've got grace, we've got mercies that are new every morning. Um, I remember talking to my son, who could often feel crushed by the past mistakes and overwhelmed about his fears for the future. We can say, listen, the past is forgiven. It's not the movie that is playing in our life today. It's the advert that we can visit to say, ah, didn't go so well when I did that last time. It's the advert that we can visit to notice the progress that we've made. It's the advert that we can visit to be thankful for the forgiveness that we've received and the grace that we've offered. But we only visit it for long enough to motivate us to keep going. And as we look towards the future and we think, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, we can say, Heavenly Father, that's yours. That's yours. Here and now, we can do this together. Look after yourself. Um, I was going to put practice self-care, but I thought that might freak a few of you out. So I've gone with look after yourself. I think practice self-care can often get stolen by too many other places that want to sell you uh, an expensive candle or for some expensive bubble bath. When I say look after yourself, I mean look after yourself, eat, sleep, talk to friends, try and walk on the outside, try and do some things that are gonna refill your tank. And guess what? As Christians, what refills our tank the most? Looking to the Lord, remembering him. Open your Bible, read a psalm, pray. Lord, help me. There's that thing where we have to put on our own oxygen masks before we can help others. As parents, it's the same. We want to tell our children, eat well, sleep well. All these things will help you with your good mental health. Don't be a hypocrite. Do it yourself first. Help them do it too. My final bullet point to remind you of this morning. Notice progress and name it. Noticing progress can be really hard, but once you get in the mindset of it, it comes a lot quicker. Noticing progress in our family and my son's struggles looked like noticing how well either one of us as parents had coped in the moment. Noticing how, uh, how we'd been patient for that bit longer. Noticing that my son had gone through an evening without struggling a day without struggling, noticing how we'd prayed that God would help us in that next stressful thing that we had to do and seeing, look, he did. Noticing progress and naming it. It's not enough for you to just notice it as a parent. Tell your child, I see you doing this. You're doing this. Because part of their problem is believing that they can. When we notice pro progress and name it, we're giving them the hope that they can build on. We see you getting it right here. They hear getting it right is possible. I can carry on. I hope today has been helpful. Do you leave with one clear conclusion or next learning step? Do you know what that is? Do you know, you don't have to do everything, there's too many things on there for you to do. What one thing could you say, we're going to really try and purposefully focus on that? I'll give you a couple of minutes to just think about that. I also wanted to mention uh, Chantal, give us a wave, um, is from the prayer team. Uh, now, if you're anything like me, the thought of going to speak to somebody in the prayer team to say, could you pray with me about this? might sort of make you feel a little bit sick. Let me reassure you, Chantal 
and many of the other, in fact, all of the other prayer team members, of whom there are some more, are lovely. And the other thing I want to reassure you is, is they have actually been trained to pray with other people and they won't hug you, they won't hug you unless you really need it, okay? Because I know that can be a barrier. Some of us, when we're upset, the thought of being hugged is awful. Some of us, when we're upset, the thought of being hugged is wonderful. Um, so if you want to go and speak to a prayer team member, be brave enough. We do have to be out of this room. Um, so Chantal, there's the prayer space, isn't there? At the back, and you're going to help people know where to go. Wonderful. Be brave. Ask for prayer. Prayer works. Um, if you've never heard of Faith in Kids before, I've got a few little things that will help you find out some of the other resources that we do. Um, I particularly wanted to, oh, I'm supposed to say, there's my uh, recommended list of things uh, to look at. A couple of books, um, Parents Podcast, Everyday Talk by John Younts. That's more of the stuff we were talking about yesterday. Raising Confident Kids in a Confusing World for Parents that are Particularly Struggling. Um, to know how to address a lot of the LGBT questions, gender, all of that. Um, that's a great book that Ed's written, and um, that would be good. And if you've got younger children, uh, how can you talk about a lot of those calming activities uh, in early life? Eliza Huey has written a book about self-calming through deep breathing and connecting with God, which is brilliant, and they're all on the bookstore.